fifth webinar of uh, CBlocks. It's a EU funded project uh, under the heading of uh, DG Connect to promote standardization in the area of, of blockchain and this distributed ledger technology. Today, um, our focus is on um, the role of blockchain standardization in the context of um, yeah, public policy, but also uh, for uh, public services uh, and, and, and cities, particularly smart cities. And uh, my pleasure is to have uh, three distinguished speakers uh, for, for, this, for this webinar addressing different topics uh, from the more kind of global level to the city level to down to even kind of public service level. Therefore, I think that's that's uh, that's a very good um, kind of level and, and uh, of different layers addressing uh, the topic and also kind of uh, showing how relevant the, the topic it is. And, uh, I think uh, we, we can start and give the floor first to Dong Kyung Kim, um, who is an um, associate press, uh, professor or, or senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. But uh, yeah, uh, he's joining us today from Tokyo, and uh, uh, his talk will address the, the geopolitical level and also putting Europe a little bit into the context of. Uh, blockchain standardization, how other uh, regions kind of are dealing with this topic and uh, it's maybe a little bit the, the cover for for our webinar and therefore I um, am happy to hand over to, um, to Dongen. We are waiting certainly for further participants but uh, also welcome to the participants and you can also use um, the, the the question and answer um, kind of uh, opportunities uh, and the chat to uh, to raise your questions uh, to our distinguished speakers. But now I uh, give uh, Nongen the floor. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, let me share this slide here. Can you can you see the slide? Okay. Yes. It's good. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, my presentation. So today's topic here is geopolitical maneuvering. So basically, comparing the uh, EU and the US approach in terms of blockchain standardization. And this is my PhD students uh, projects. <clears throat> this is uh, he is the first year student. So. Right now, I'm just showing you the, my our like research uh, directions. So hopefully, I can get some feedback. It's going to help us to like further uh, investigate these topics more in the future. So, cryptocurrency right now, uh, we have like you know more than nine thousand uh, different type of cryptocurrencies. Uh, as you could see, the number of cryptocurrency dramatically increases, but. Uh, after uh, 2020, November, the number uh, drops a little bit. And after that, the, the whole number of cryptocurrency has been a little bit more stabilized. What happened was in uh, uh, 2022, in November, there was kind of a series of events. One is the uh, Luna Terra uh, cryptocurrency, they meltdown. After that, there's FTX uh, went bankrupt. So there are, FTX is cryptocurrency uh, exchange. So because of those hiccups, uh, market send a kind of signal that we need, we need to have a more stable uh, form of like, you know, cryptocurrencies. And because of that, people start to pay attention to what is the more stable form of cryptocurrency. And the, one of the very important like, you know, alternative of the cryptocurrency is the stable coin. So now people start to focusing on the what is the more stable uh, type of like you know, stable coins. So that's something I'm gonna discuss, the standardization approaches to stable coin. And after that, Bitcoins right now, the value has kind of 
went up again, this dramatic decrease, but now the whole the price start to like, you know, uh, gain a little bit more like, you know, attractions now. And then one, one of the important notice after the 2022, Bitcoin become like in you know, the strongest, the cryptocurrency in the world. It means people looking for more stable uh, cryptocurrency rather than choosing the risky uh, uh, cryptocurrency. And the Bitcoin is the most like you know, noticeable uh, cryptocurrencies and well-known cryptocurrencies. So now people start to uh, try to buy more uh, Bitcoin rather than other type of risky uh, cryptocurrencies. And even U.S. government has increased uh, their Bitcoin holdings since the, the bearish market trend in 2021 or 22. So the research gap is there are some research focused on this uh, blockchain standardizations, and there are some studies focused on the geopolitical perspective standardization. So what we want to look into it is this like comparing different approaches to blockchain and also see how these geopolitical issues played a certain role in the like you know, certain different approaches. So US, the most important actors here is the NIST uh, and then uh, ANSI. So NIST developed uh, certain cryptographic standards and the NIST, the, there are many working groups, but the most important working group is that those experts focusing on the uh, cryptographic technology and those cryptographic technology working groups start to develop other type of like you know, more in-depth uh, cryptographic standards and then on this the IR, the internal report uh, 8301 is the most important document in terms of token design. So they talk about how they're going to standardize cryptocurrencies uh, approaches. And after they can uh, NIST uh, provide some guidance, uh, some of the uh, specification become a like, uh, uh, national standards through the uh, NAS side. But th this is one of the important differences here is like, you know, uh, US has made an effort, more like a first mover efforts into these token design aspects. So Europe also uh, do a lot of like, standardization in, uh, in terms of blockchains, but the, the one of the like in a slight difference we identify here is, is US is more focusing on financial actors, the particular application of these blockchain technology within this uh the cryptocurrency deep, uh, uh domains token domains that that's where the europe wasn't really quite advanced in terms of token design or other like an application so th this is the uh us standardization standard related documents and topics the block cryptographic blockchains and blockchain system architecture governance security ma uh, management smart contract, uh, wallet key management, transaction um, management, these are all important standardization areas. But in terms of application, you see the identity issues, identify things like internet of things, supply chains, and FinTech, related to the FinTech, there are many different form of standardization activities happening uh, in the US. But when I look at the uh, Europe, the, the one of the noticeable differences is this financial elements. So there's a less activities ongoing in the Europe's standardization uh, in terms of blockchain. So US is way more focusing on this uh, fintech related activities. So EU standardization. So the there are many different standardization bodies uh, play a very important role, and then we focus on the most SEN. SEN is one of the like very important like standardization body. And then like Etsy and then other like standardization body do their own activities in terms of blockchains. So coordination between these different standardization body is not quite there yet. So I'm, I'm not really sure they how they coordinated this whole blockchain activities in terms of like different standardized bodies. Um, that's, that's something that uh, Europe need to think about, like how they're gonna coordinate this whole blockchain uh, standardizations across the different standardization bodies. So in terms of SEN, uh, SEN are like, you know, heavily involved in the ISO. So they try to align the older like, standardization activity with I ISO. So many the uh, SEN standards is kind of referring to ISO standards. 
right? So they try to have more consistent like you know, approaches with the ISO. And in terms of application, the notice of application is the identity, digital identity wallet standards and the blockchains. Uh, so that digital identity is something that Europe is hey, uh, focused on a lot. So many standardization activities is kind of revolving around the digital identity. That, that's something we uh, noticed. So because the SEN are uh, usually referring to the ISO standards in terms of blockchain, so I, we look at the blockchain, ISO blockchain standards. So ISO standards comprise of like 11 published standards, like an incomplete, uh, incomplete eight standards in development, six standards like to gain the blockchain. Those are the like an you know, area, uh, but but you can see in terms of use case, like you know, Internet of Things, food, uh, industry, traceability, and the conformity assessments, like semantic resolution exchange. But financial services, when I look at the financial services, they usually looking at the, like you know, security in the public uh, key infrastructures. So it's more related to the cryptographic uh, technology so rather than like an application into the a token design and cryptocurrency. So there are limited application in the, the token design standardization in Europe. That, that is something we noticed. So now there are new regulations coming up in the uh, EU, which is very important, call is Mika. And that's something I'm, I'm gonna discuss a little bit more. So stable coin played a very important role nowadays. Uh, and then the stable coin has a little bit of bridge wall between the cryptocurrency and fiat currency. Basically what crypto uh, stable coin does do is, is they pack the value of cryptocurrency to the US dollars or the any other fiat currency. So it is they stabilize the currency uh, value. It's a, because like one of the problem of uh, cryptocurrency is the, their value uh, change uh, quite often. So volatility of the value of cryptocurrency is one of the big problem uh, because they cannot use this cryptocurrency for uh, the transaction purposes. So you, because you cannot predict the value of these the cryptocurrency because they change every time, every moment. So in order to fix this problem, they try to pay the value of the cryptocurrency to the US dollars or the Euro dollars. Uh, that, that is the way to solve the problem. That, that's what we call as a stable coin. And the US is more prioritizing that like, regulating stable coins from the financial uh, market perspective. That's something I'm, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. And then uh, EU has their own like, you know, one single market approach. So try to harmonize all different like, you know, regulatory systems within EU, but also not only the within EU, they wanna uh, expand their regulatory power to the other countries as well, as typically the EU try to do in terms of digital regulation, which is called oftentimes called Brussels effect. So this is another example of the Brussels effect of Mika. And then this Mika try to formulate new regulation and you know, protect promote the creation of euro backed stablecoin. That, that is something important. So the, some of the people in the uh, European agency uh, decision-making process, they see the, a lot of stable coins now based on the US dollars. So that actually increased the dollars, the power too much. So every the new currency is revolving on the US dollar, right? That increased the value of the US dollar more. So they see this is part, part, part of the problem. So in, in a way to, to counteract this dominance of the US dollar, they want to promote certain stable coin, which is bad, but Euro. So that's a little bit of uh, geopolitical competition is happening in terms of standardization activity or regulatory activities as well. So uh, US approach, from my perspective, it, it is more financial market driven in uh, blockchains. So US, like a standard stable coin has a very important use case of the blockchain. And so basically the all like, you know, uh, financial market play, like, you know, play a very important role. And then even the US regulatory body, uh, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commissions, they try to regulate the uh, cryptocurrency because they see this coin uh, 
cryptocurrency as a financial instrument. So this is a big debate on in the US whether the cryptocurrency are the financial instrument or not. So some people argue it is not, some people uh, argue it is. So that, that is a very important debate on the definition of the financial instrument, whether uh, to, these cryptocurrency is part of the financial instrument. If it is part of financial instrument, it means it has to be regulated under the existing financial regulations. So whether we're gonna apply the existing financial regulation or we're gonna create a new regulation. So that, that is a big debate on this. And what EU try to take is a different approach. They wanna create a new regulation to regulate this emerging phenomenon, emerging technology rather than applying the existing financial regulation. So that's where the differences come from. So EU, they try to create a new regulation called as a MICA. And then when you look, read this European ICT role, rolling plans, this is one of the very important, showing the strategic direction of the uh, EU. They clearly recommended, the recommended action is the European standardization organization the need to should develop the standard needed for introduction of programmable euro, like so, and the token economy. So basically, they want to support the creation of euro backed stable coins. They clearly uh, show their intention. They we need to support these euro backed coins. This is one of the like you know, motivation behind the geopolitical competition. And then there are many statements like you know the regulation like a Mika. Uh, might encourage big companies to get involved in uh, cryptocurrency, particularly Eurocoin. If what Mika does, this type of regulation provides certain uh, legal stability, certainty, right? So one of the problem that this the cryptocurrency service providers has is the lack of trust on the uh, stable coin. So they need certain legal uh, stability and guarantee. And this type of regulation, the European regulation, as long as they comply with, with this type of regulation, what this service provider can get is certain stability and guarantee and trust from the customers. Right? So this is why they want to create this euro back for stable coins. And as you can see, the circle, circle is one of the like a big stable coin provider, uh, which provide has been providing this uh, USDC. USDC is second largest uh, stable coin. Uh, right after the tether. And then these uh, circle, they create these Euroback standards uh, called as uh, EURC, right? And then they believe this Mika is a very important play, is going to play a very important role in promoting the Euroback, uh, their stable coin. So there is a certain like, you know, uh, partnership between this uh, digital regulation and then create, supporting these you know, Euroback stable coins as well. So in terms of EU standardization uh, with regard to Mika, so Mika, uh, they regulate this kind of whole rules of the cryptocurrency within the Euro market, uh, and then also harmonizing this uh, technical regimes. And there are three different types of the crypto asset. They define the three different types of crypto asset. One is asset reference tokens, another is e-money uh, token, other is other tokens. What stable coins fall into is that the first and second categories. So if the stable coin is backed by one single fiat, it's going to consider as an e-money coin. If it is kind of backed by the commodities or the other different type of, at least like, you know, more than one uh, the fiat currency, uh, they're going to consider as asset reference coins and token. And if they fall under this category, they need to comply with this Mika regulations. And what this regulation says, they, they require the ESMA, European Security and Market Authority, to submit the draft standards and the regulatory standard and the implementing standard. So clearly this regulation shows that this, the authority need to develop these certain technical standards and the implementing standards. So in that way, these standards will play the very important guideline how this cryptocurrency has to be uh, managed. So when 
we look into the like you know the more details of the Mika, what Mika want to emphasize. This is one of the most important regulations in my perspective. What Mika want to do is they ask for some authorization of the cryptocurrency. So if you want to provide service in terms of cryptocurrency, you need to uh, get some license in the euro, right? So in order to get a like, you know, license, you need to provide, meet the certain requirements. And one of the requirements is uh, the information uh, submission. So the one of the big problem of the cryptocurrency right now is the information asymmetry. So only one is, a small group of people uh, monopolize all the relevant information and then the all other users do not really don't understand what's really happening within the systems. So what this micro regulation one is to increase the transparency. So they ask this company service provider to provide the information, all the relevant information, and that way the customers will have a better uh, information about how this cryptocurrency system actually works. So information about identity, the programmable operations, like you know, governance arrangement, internal control mechanisms, and the segregation between the like clients asset and funds and execution policy and then like you know commercial policy, they ask this service provider to provide this all this information. And how they're gonna provide the information, they uh, try to comply with this technical or regulation or standards. So standard will play a standard will play a very important role in meeting these all the important requirements in, under the Mika regulatory regimes. But what one thing I, I noticed in the in the the in the decision making process of the Mika regulation uh, in the past, there are three different options the European Commission consider. One option is creating the customized the stablecoin approach, right? They're addressing all the problem with respect to global like, you know, stablecoin. Second option is applying the existing financial regulation. And third option is just looking at only the EU issues rather than the global st uh, stablecoins. But ultimately what the EC, the uh, European Commission chose the option of you know, applying the, uh, creating the Mika was the creating the customized stable coin customized the regulation for cryptocurrency, which can be applicable to the global uh, cryptocurrency rather than EU smaller. So it, it clearly shows that uh, it is the EU's intention to uh, highly involve in this global uh, cryptocurrency area and then play certain very important role in, in this area. This is why the geopolitical tension is very important to understand this whole dynamics. And the importance of sta uh, stable coin is because it's gonna play the very important in the DeFi uh, environment. So DeFi is a decentralized uh, finance and this gonna like, you know, play a very important role as alternative to the central like in banking system or financial systems right now. And then instead of like in you know, a fiat currency in here, the stable coin will play a very important role in this circulating this uh, DeFi ecosystem. But because the, all the stable coins is in uh, US bank system, this is why Euro CS, this, Europe CS, this is a sort of problem because it is linked to all the business and financial uh, alternative ecosystems. So this is why in the future, there are more activities, standardization activities will uh, play a very important role in the stable uh, coin, as well as the DeFi ecosystem in the future. So this is something that we need to keep paying attention to. Uh, this is all right, prepare. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dongan, um, for kind of giving us an, an insight into the, the different kind of regulatory approaches uh, related to uh, yeah, cryptocurrencies, uh, means on the, on, the, on the bigger level. Um, I think I, I propose that um, we move on to the next speaker, and because I have two or three questions for you, but... Uh, since the time is running and I want also to give the other speakers the appropriate slots that I will hand on to, to Anthony Bocolo um, from Oslo. Um, now to uh, go down on the on the city level, uh, talking about standardization for smart cities. And uh, Anthony, I, I give you the floor now. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. I will try to uh, share my screen. Try to get a file. There you Can you see my screen? Yes, very well. Thank you. Can you can you see my screen clearly? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me or can you see my screen? Just to confirm. All, all good. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Today I'll be presenting about uh, one of my uh, current studies uh, uh, on the DLT standardization. And this uh, study is already published in this uh, journal. So it's about uh, a framework that was developed for the standardization of uh, DLT, that is distributed ledger technologies uh, for interoperable data integration and alignment, mostly uh, in the sustainable smart city uh, domain. So. Yes, so for today, I have some brief agenda. So I'll talk a little about the introduction of uh, uh, standardization in TLTs, uh, mostly for smart city domain. And then the research focus, uh, existing standards uh, within the smart uh, sustainable city uh, cluster, the methodology will apply for our research. And then some brief qualitative findings, and then some of the open issues we are facing currently in this area, and then some recommendation, and lastly, the conclusion from uh, this uh, findings. So for the uh, introduction, so currently, uh, uh, municipalities and cities and communities, they are uh, adopting uh, digital technologies, emerging technologies such as uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies to provide data-driven services to the citizens and to other stakeholders. But, uh, this DLT is once this application are being uh, deployed in uh, urban context, uh, they are also faced with some issues. And this DLT is actually uh, adopted to help uh, address data silos securely and in a reliable way to provide uh, secured and uh, safe uh, services to uh, citizens. And standardization uh, is actually important in providing these services. For example, in providing standards, it helps to support uh, like open innovation uh, within the uh, urban ecosystem and also to facilitate trust uh, among different stakeholders who may know or not know each other. But uh, a finding, actually, current finding uh, from IBM suggested that actually most uh, of these uh, enterprises that provide services for citizens in urban context, they actually face with some issues. And one of these issues that I mentioned was that there was a lack of standards is going to help them to provide these data driven services when they employ uh, technologies, innovative technologies like uh, blockchain. And so it is actually important uh, to carry out this uh, standardization support towards achieving common uh, taxonomy of maybe different data sources used, or I uh, talked about open protocols like the interfaces used by different technologies, and also achieving a common language. Uh, all this can help toward achieving this interoperability actually between different uh, TIT systems and also uh, existing uh, digital platforms and legacy systems that has been deployed in an uh, urban context. And moreover, these standards uh, and help uh, governments and trusted as a, uh, as a trusted solution for them to complement existing uh, policies and regulation on use of different technologies in urban context. So in a sustainable smart city environment, uh, uh, one of the earlier findings actually suggested that the, the use of uh, DLT like the distributed ledger technology like blockchain is faced with issues of scalability. And also there's a lack of uh, the standards that is needed in using this technology in smart cities. 
And with that standards, it's difficult to achieve uh, different data, different process procedures, and also uh, global communication within different partners. So this is not going to be viable. And also standards is actually really, really important because it can help to achieve interoperability and also try to reduce these fragmented uh, ecosystems of different uh, systems that are operating in silos. So achieving a standardization can help, of DLTs can help to try address this issue. And moreover, standardization can help to support this extensibility of uh, different DLTs because uh, one of the issues faced is that there are so many uh, DLTs being employed in different regions, in different countries, even in different cities by different partners and different uh, uh, stakeholders. And there's need for standardization of these uh, different, different uh, platforms, like different blockchains. And in urban context, there have been some existing works being carried out, like the IEEE 2418, and yeah, they have this P particular one, and they have this ISOTC. So these standards are uh, currently being carried out, and most of them are still uh, in, in the development process, where some are already being published. And there's also some working groups being developed. So they try to address these issues of uh, interoperability and standardization of different interfaces. But one of the problems they're facing is how to achieve this uh, alignment and integration between different systems and different between different data uh, uh, ecosystems. And so there's need to support this uh, standardization and also the to provide the interoperable uh, services in small cities. So this is actually still a challenge because in small cities, they have different, different systems that are run to provide different services. Like we have the mobility services, we have the energy services, we have the health services. So these services need to be interoperable. And using DLT and achieving standardization of DLT, we believe this can help to address this issue, which is at the moment still a challenge uh, to be achieved practically in the urban context. So in uh, smart cities, we have different kind of DLTs, which I know most of the audience is aware of. We have the blockchain, which is the most uh, widely used. We have an uh, Arch graph, we have Tempo, and we have Odoo chain, and then we have the directed acyclic graph. So in my study and work in this uh, domain, I have worked with uh, uh, DAG, that's DAC, and whereby we use this IOTA Tango. And most of the audience may be familiar with IOTA Tango. So I will try to talk a little about IOTA Tango and how we use it in uh, smart uh, cities to achieve sustainable cities and how we try to achieve standardization with DLTs for uh, IOTA with uh, existing digital systems and also legacy platforms that is being deployed in smart cities. So for this uh, presentation, my main focus is actually going to talk a little like the current and DLT standards that's been developed or already in progress that is more towards supporting this DLT interoperability, mostly in sustainable smart city context. And then how can we actually promote this standardization of DLTs, mostly to uh, promote or to enhance DLT interoperability? And then what are the open issues or the challenges we are facing currently? And then what are some possible recommendations that is uh, proposed from the literature on how to facilitate DLT standardization, mostly in one context, that's like for sustainable smart cities. So at the moment, uh, from the literature, there are a lot of, a lot of actually I use a lot again of standards being carried out. So many of them are working groups. Many of these standards are already being implemented based on pilot uh, cases uh, uh, across uh, Europe and across uh, other parts of the world. So one of the most uh, popular uh, standards is oh, so one of the most popular standards is the W3C uh, standard for DLT, whereby they try to address a uh, 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 standardization of blockchain and they provide some guidelines. And then the ITU standard is also another a standard being uh, carried out recently. And then we have the IEEE and then the ISO and TC307. So these uh, four main uh, standards are the leading uh, standards in. Uh, DLT standardization that is applicable mostly for the smart and sustainable city context. And also there are also other standards like the Internet Research Task Group uh, Force. They're also working on standards in this same domain. And then we have the ANSI uh, accredited, accredited Standards Committee. And then there are other associated standards, about 12 of them uh, across the world. 
also working on blockchain standardization. So from this, you can see that there's a lot of work being done in this area. And this shows the importance of uh, standardization for the DLT ecosystem. And this is based on the potential of this technology for not just for smart cities or for sustainable cities, but for other domains uh, in the society. And also, uh, there is this uh, ISO working group that is working on uh, blockchain and DLT development. So they have these seven uh, subgroups in each of them. So we have this the working group. Uh, we have the groups that work on possible use cases that this technology can be implemented on. And then they have the group on security, privacy, and identity uh, management of the assets or for, for users. And they have the smart contract working group. And then we have the governance and the interoperability group. So for my research, I mostly work on the last two, mostly on governance and on the interoperability part. How can we govern the use of uh, blockchain, for example? Most of the existing work actually employ blockchain to govern existing systems. But how do we govern this blockchain? Who use blockchain? Who develop blockchains, for example? Who write this code? And who are the key stakeholders for using this uh, technology? So I actually work on that. And I also work on interoperability of blockchain. So for this, I also work on the interoperability of blockchain. How two or three different kind of blockchain can work together. They are different. For example, Hyperledger connecting with Ethereum, connecting with the IOTA Tango, and how can blockchain work with each other, same blockchain like interoperability. So I uh, mostly do some research on interoperability and interoperability of uh, distributed ledger technologies. And so I will show a little of uh, what we design uh, in our project. So we have this uh, project that is uh, funded by EU. It's just ended last year. It's uh, called City Exchange. So the idea of this project is we try to uh, develop a a feature that we plan, we, we intend to live in. It's a project uh, that was carried out in Norway and in Highland. And then we also have 26 other partners, like 26 partners, core partners in the project. We have the lighthouse cities and the fuller cities. So one of the goal we, we plan to achieve was, the first was to prototype the future. And then we enable this feature and then we accelerate the future. So we carried out an integrated planning and design on using different modeling techniques to provide digital support to, and then we developed like a common energy market. And one of these technology we use was blockchain. So blockchain was used for the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, energy training and energy sharing and energy tracking to know the energy provenance. And also we used blockchain also like the uh, IOTA Tango for electric mobility services. And then lastly, we carry out a community engagement. So in current how this project, this is just a summary of the project uh, in, I try to I try to uh, like uh, summarize in this slide. You can uh, look more about the project from this uh, website uh, if you want to know more. And we developed this uh, architecture like a uh, framework. So we have employed a design science approach whereby we came up with an architectural model that helps to address uh, data alignments and integration from different uh, systems. So due to the time constraint, I'm not going to go into detail of this uh, uh, architecture. Uh, I already explained this in this publication, what I'm actually discussing about. So we try to use this to see how uh, distributed ledger technology can achieve uh, energy sharing, uh, secure and safe energy sharing, transparent, and also a, a, by also considering the GDPR aspect of uh, the uh, users when using this technology. So we carried out a, I would say a simple methodology whereby we developed, first of all, the framework stack, which I just showed in the other right-hand side of the slide, the different layers. And then this was developed based on secondary data from existing policy documents, from existing literatures uh, on uh, uh, architectural developments. And then we identified different use cases on, and uh, we identified different KPIs or smart city KPIs that we want to measure. And then we collected data to validate this standardization and framework. And then based on this, we had some preliminary findings and then we did our modeling based on the feedback we got from the experts. So we, I showed three, three main uh, case uh, the areas, integrated planning and design is one, this common energy market, and then the community agent. So based on these three areas, 
there's three different use cases that was explored. So the first was this distributed energy trading market platform on how we can develop this project using uh, distributed energy technology. And then second was this seamless electric mobility system using DLT. And then we have this planning and design of the positive energy district, whereby energy is traded, energy is shared, energy is generated uh, using a renewable energy source. And they will try to show how we can achieve a standardized ecosystem using DLT to enable the interoperability with uh, existing uh, digital systems that is developed in the urban context and also these legacy systems which were already running. So the idea is to have this uh, the digital ecosystem like energy as a service, uh, mobility as a service, and data as a service. And this is enabled by uh, DLT. So three main uh, cases was explored. So the first is achieving this common energy market. Uh, a second is increased uptake of e-mobility solution. And last is the planning and design. So in carrying out these use cases, we developed our, our systems using IOTA Tango. So if you want to know more about IOTA, IOTA is one of the uh, DLTs. So it's, it uses a DAC, which I showed from the initial uh, start of the slide. Uh, we use this technology and then we try to employ it in these uh, use cases. So this is an example of uh, the use case for the energy uh, marketplace. So I did this development. Uh, this was done uh, about uh, 2021 when the project were, was started. So we try to model using uh, this software called Akimate uh, Enterprise Architecture Modeling Language. So I try to put the link of the tool here and I'm not going to explain what this notation means. So there's the explanation of this here. So this tool was developed by this open group. So they developed this tool. So using this tool, I try to develop and conceptualize the energy marketplace uh, ecosystem that shows how all the systems in smart city connect together. So this is like a model of the application we developed. So this was the model and then the system was developed based on this. So I will just go through. So we had the physical infrastructure layer where we capture the physical uh, energy metering and sensors. And then we have other physical devices like the electric cars and charging instruments. And then we also have all that technologies that has been developed, for example, like micro payment infrastructures. We have the IOTA assets. So the IOTA is the IOTA Tango, the DLT physical infrastructure. And then we also have the IOTA Tango, which is employed as the backend, where it gets all the data from different uh, sources, comes to this uh, platform. And then we have the application that is powered by DLT. And then we have the different companies that integrate together, that work together to provide services. So we provide different services, and this is the goal we aim to achieve. So it's scalable, interoperable, pay-to-pay -pay energy trading. So this is just an example of how we try to achieve a standardized ecosystem for an energy marketplace. So the idea is how can we standardize DLT with existing uh, platforms that is already running, both legacy systems and other digital systems. So this is just one of the examples. And we also try to use other uh, APIs. We develop our own APIs, the projects that enable this uh, interoperability with uh, existing systems. So this is one of the use case. And the second use case is the mobility use case whereby we try to provide electric mobility services similar to the energy. So this also, we employ uh, the DLT. As you can see from here, we employ micro payment infrastructure enabled by DLT. And then the, this was done in partnership with IOTA. IOTA is a DLT company is based in Germany. So we collaborated with them. So they actually provided the DLT system that powers this uh, ecosystem of the electric mobility uh, services. So due to the time constraint, I'm not going to go deep into this. Um, the Anthony, also, the, Anthony, yes. Anthony, uh, I think uh, you have to wrap up because I, yes. I would also give uh, Rene the, the floor and yes, yes, yes. Uh, maybe that's that's very interesting, but but maybe we can skip that and just move to your recommending yes. last slide or something like yes. that. I don't know how many uh, this yes, is. Yes, yes. Yes, so uh, overall, one minute. Uh, in, uh, one minute. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, one minute. So uh, in our work, we found out that these are the existing issues that we face in TLT standardization. And then we also propose some possible recommendations that we think 
uh, should be implemented to address this issue. So in summary, uh, in this uh, research, we developed this uh, reference architecture that helps to provide an understanding of standardization of DLT. And we hope from this work, we can achieve an open, common, and interoperable uh, reference architecture. Although we use only IOTA Tango as our distributed ledger technology to show three different working proof of concepts in Smart City. And this is uh, most of the reference we use of our work. And also this is some of the uh, work stuff we're working on currently that have been published on these areas, published in different journals. So if you're interested in knowing more about our work, you can read through these papers. And this is my uh, information in case you want to have more, want to talk to me or communicate with me. So I have two affiliation. So you can contact me from this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is all. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Um, very, very interesting. Um, and therefore, you have already some questions in the in the Q and A section. However, yes. um, Rene's Rene's talk will probably uh, nicely kind of match with uh, what what you have started to uh, to uh, to raise um, in your presentation. Therefore, I will give. Uh, um, Rene, now the floor, and we have then the final round uh, when when time is is left. Rene, yeah. So hello, everybody. You should see the screen now. Yeah, perfect. So I can start. Thanks a lot for the previous presentation. It looks at. Um, that um that uh, a lot of people already know what sensation is about and that they already discovered the most important sensation technical committees uh, i will talk about uh, in a short presentation i will try to make a bit um, less time than to to uh, to to take the time which uh, which i lost a bit to the other presentations back a bit so we have uh, three different topics in my presentation the first one is generally to to say something about sensation and research innovation projects which is uh, also in the, in the face of uh, anthony who was just talking about another project so i would like to raise this issue shortly then i will come to um, to the outcomes um, uh, of sensation activities of the impulse project which is on blockchain and dlt management and uh, then which is one quite important uh, aspect which i heard a lot now it's about very much um, and it's a lot of sensation committees existing but there's not mentioning how to actually engage with them so uh, i would like to address this as well in my last uh, slides uh for regarding standards and research innovation there has been a, a project called um, the bridge or bridging the gap in between research innovation which results are available on the standards plus innovation.eu website here we have analyzed um, um, that uh, that standards standards are a catalyst for innovation that it supports for example 40 billion of the approximately contribution of civilization to the economic growth in germany france and the united kingdom each year and it's it shows also here um, that more than 200,000 experts are actually involved in sanitation only on European level. And uh, that, uh, of course, sanitation, as mentioned before, has a lot of different benefits, which I'm not going to uh, in detail too much now at this stage. Um, just like to just shortly mention, because I think it's quite crucial to consider why you uh, include sanitation, why you should um, um, use the different sanitation activities in a project. It's first of all, of course, what um, what the other my my two previous um, um, speakers said is like you have to analyze actually actually what kind of stands are existing on the topic in order to use them or in order to be able to see okay there could be a contribution possible. Then um, based on this, you you should um, identify the sensation potentials which your project might have to contribute to these activities. And usually you identify more than only two or three act, uh, activities to which you can contribute. For this reason, you should think about the sensation strategy, well, how you could maybe develop an own standard from your activities, or you uh, contribute to existing sensation work of technical committees. Then you conduct the activities and a very, very much important um, aspect in the end is also to disseminate and exploit the standardization activities because the, um, the, the, um, they have to be visible in order to be used uh, because the standardization system is um, providing the information, but the experts and all of the, um, the ones who are using the standards need to, to, to raise awareness on them as well. 
Uh, just like to mention, because I have seen um, several times now different aberrations of standards. So you can see here on the on the right hand side the standard which are widely used here from today from from ISO level, from international level, but we also have the European level. Sense like was mentioned from the first speak as well. Then we have the national level, different standardization bodies, and just to mention that. The, the different standardization bodies on national level, they are contributing with the experts to European and international level. Then we have um, this kind of pre-standard work, which is in a technical committee, uh, uh -huh. like this uh, technical specification, technical reports. And uh, if you do not do it on a, on a committee level, there's also a possibility to do it, uh, for example, directly from a research project, then you can develop uh, um, a document such, such as a sense like workshop agreement, uh, which is not in the structure of a technical committee uh, or in on national levels, for example, in Germany, we have Steen specification. And important here, it's an open body of experts so everybody can join these activities in, co in comparison to the consortial standard, which is a closed uh, uh, body of experts. As mentioned before, standardsplusinnovation.eu is a website which we have developed and there's also uh, e-learning on standards uh, and innovation if you're interested to learn more about it. Now, coming to the um, uh, the Impulse project, which has received funding and was finalized in the end of January this year. And uh, this Impulse project is about identity management in public services. Uh, and there we analyze the impact of blockchain and artificial intelligence to improve electronic identities. Um, uh, we had uh, different partners and uh, in total six use cases uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from way northern of Europe in Reykjavik in Iceland um, to um, to, um, to have a better participatory uh, democracy portal uh, until uh, the further south, uh, for example, at Science and Spain to have just an online complaints filling service um, uh, or public services app, which was in the city of Gijón in Spain. Um, what we have done there, as, as mentioned from these activities before, we have analyzed the existing standards and uh, rated impacts and implementa implementations, implementations. And uh, there we have analyzed a lot of standards which are related to the topic. So um, you can see it on the left side. Um, we have, uh, because there was a lot of standards, we tried to put them in a, in a, in a format that can be used by the project partner. It was in a dashboard where you can search for the information. Uh, we have um, we are roughly analyzed the standardization landscape in a quite broad context with different um, 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 activities included there, which I would not go into detail, but you have the chance to download um, our paper we have developed there, um, uh, which is you can just use the IR code to download it um, and uh, check for more information how to actually analyze the standardization landscape uh, in a research project. Uh, but in fact, the most important, of course, what comes out of this analysis. And here you can see um, um, uh, if a couple of, uh, of of documents. Some of them have been already mentioned before, but some of them not. And I would uh, raise not here the attention to the international one. I would like to raise international, uh, the attention to the national ones because you have to imagine that usually um, and the proposal for a standard is always coming from a national point of view and then it's trigger to European or international level. So it's not uh, usually directly developed um, on, on ISO level um, in the in the phase of the development of the document, yes, but not in the preliminary stage. So somebody has to make the proposal. <laughs> and uh, and for example, there was one um, uh, standard um, um, from uh, from UNE, the standardization body uh, of Spain, uh, 7107, uh, the first part, which is on digital enabling technologies, uh, distributing identity management model on blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies, part one, the reference framework. And this is actually the first standard on this topic, which really dealt um, uh, on, on the des decentralized identities oriented to people, physical, legal, which includes a description of an approach based on life cycles and the relationship of the main actors that participate in them, as well as interrelations among them. Uh, uh, these, um, when we identified this standard, we said, like, okay, it's good that the standard is existing, but somehow that's a part one. So it seems that there are coming more parts. So it's uh, it's actually important to check how we can actually contribute from our project to the development of the first documents. Um, so based on the identification of standardization potentials out of the impulse uh, project results, we have um, developed a standardization strategy and we decided to directly um, support the ongoing standardization activities in the technical committees 
We have um, established a liaison with uh, with a European Technical Committee, um, which is belonging to the uh, uh, to the topics, and we have also directly participated in the uh, Spanish standardization work on blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. In this case, it was possible for us as a project to directly influence the standardization activities and uh, to provide the research outcomes directly in the content. Because also it says as uh, in the uh, in the on the definition of actually a standard that it also should be based on science and um, and, and innovation. So it's quite important to consider this. Just last but not least, uh, as I said before, it's good that you can participate in sensation as an open um, um, system, but of course, uh, most people don't know how to do it. One effective tool for uh, for the association or like a project research project is to to establish a liaison with sensation committee. So we have different benefits of this. You can directly access the working documents, so the draft standards and so on, and you can participate in the meetings on association committees. So you are directly engaged with the uh, with the experts on the on the topic of interest. And uh, of course, you have to follow the rules for uh, standardization. So the documents which are, are like being developed has ha have a specific format, but also you have some communication rules that you, of course, cannot share the draft standards like this directly without uh, prior um, 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 confirmation from this uh, of this uh, technical committee. And the, the practical implementation actually is that a project representative provides input to, to this technical committee. There is a sensor like guide 25, which includes all this information on a liaison, which is also similar available on ISO and IC level. What we have done in the project of um, of uh, of imports, we have identified the different standardization committees on blockchain. You can see on the right side, I often heard today the ISO TC 307, so it's the international level, but I would focus on this that you have the three uh, levels. So the national level are experts involved and the national level is sending one, two experts to European and also to international level. So you always have this kind of mirroring of the activities of uh, from international European level. So in this case, we have identified the standardization committees and we have then, as mentioned before, have done this liaison and the participation, this further work. And last but not least, the last slide here uh, that uh, showed a bit like the, the engagement. You can see on the right side um, a picture, of course, and during the pandemic situation, not everything is on uh, uh, physically, also the vis uh, virtual participation is possible. And it says that it's really, it's, it gave, in this case, um, 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 a colleague of the Impulse project coordinator, Jaime he, from Gradient, uh, he was really like, okay, it, it was really possible for them to follow the organization task, not only at national level, but also on European international level at the same time, and to see what kind of um, difficulties um, are on, on the different levels. And also it was possible for them to really give or to get fir uh, first-hand insight on the development of this UNE standard, which has been the first part on the standard service, which should be consist of five parts, though they are like approaching to support the other four parts as well in the next years. So that was a short summary of my uh, of my presentation. Thanks a lot. More information on the Pulse project you find on the on the website on the um, on the bottom or you just can contact me as well. Thanks a lot. Thank thank, thank you Rene for showing us a little bit kind of also uh, the the real doing and also especially the link um between uh, research projects and, and standardization. And uh, um, since we have uh, here um, a hand raised by Stefan Caporali, I, I would like to give him uh, the floor to ask his question. Are you still there, Stefan? No. Okay, uh, it's it's noon, and um, I I have um, to share at least uh, uh, one slide because um, uh, we have here the opportunity um, to also fund your activities related blockchain standardization, um, especially at the at the European level, and uh, there are 
yeah, um, different calls, and the next one is going to uh, to close by by uh, May twentieth. Therefore, if you have um, proposals, please submit that. Um, there is there is really funding opportunity, a realistic funding opportunity uh, uh, available. Uh, and, uh, and and if you have questions, please come back to us. Uh, that's the, that's the first one. Um, yeah, there's more going on regarding blockchain standardization. Um, it's the Blockchain Island Week uh, in, in, in Dublin, um, and also an IEEE international conference on, on blockchain and crypto uh, currency um, hackathons. That means that's all taking place the end of May, beginning of June in uh, uh, in in Dublin and um, and finally also a, a hybrid workshop in Osaka at the Comsec uh, conference at at the beginning of July, where we have received uh, interesting uh, uh, submissions. Um, now uh, there was here somebody in the chat. Uh, is Stefan now with us? No. Uh, okay, I, he probably he probably left. Um, um, yeah. Any any other questions? There's one one questions in in the Q and A on on uh, uh, the European Blockchain Observatory. I'm not sure who is going to answer this. Uh, um, that's that's we we take this this on board. Um, um, I Katrina um, will not get that um, since we are all, already over time. What I what I have learned is um, um, I think there are, there are many opportunities for blockchain applications uh, like like uh, Anthony you have showed us uh, in the smart city context. There's the, the close link to. To regulation, we already had a, a webinar on regulation standardization. Maybe it's time to to have another one. And uh, on on the other hand, uh, I think the, the the smart city context is a is a quite rich one. Therefore, maybe the last question to to Anthony: Is there some follow up work to be expected from 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 you and your team? Uh, yes, yes. We are, thank you for this uh, useful question. Yes, we are currently trying to get funding for from the Norwegian Research Council on uh, blockchain and uh, digital technology for energy sharing, tracking, and sharing to to track to to see the source of the energy energy provenance. So there is a research on that we are currently working on. Okay. Thank you. Um, the... Rene, thanks for, for your contribution about the impulse. There's also a paper uh, to be shared. I don't know whether maybe you can put it in the chat. Um, maybe last question to Dong Yu, because you are currently sitting in, in, uh, in, in Tokyo. Um, what is the, the Japanese approach to blockchain, uh, maybe using, on the one hand, the regulatory framework, on the other hand, standardization? Uh, um, is there is there maybe also a, a kind of a strategic approach to that? Like we have seen that from the US, but also from Europe. Uh, that, that that's something uh, I haven't investigated yet. So I, I'll look into it a little bit more, and then I give the answer next time I'm uh, okay. with you. But one thing I noticed here is quite interesting. What's happening? Tokyo, they try to link this startup with the standardization. Usually startups are not really interested in standardization. Standardization is usually costly. And the many startups are not really big into East Asia, at least East Asia is in standardization. But now these whole governments, like you know, a little bit support of this kind of linking startup with the, the standardization activity. That's what's happening in, uh, at least in Japan. They try to like, link this Standard uh, startup supporting systems ecosystem with the standardization activity. So there are some like an you know, efforts that has been made, but with a little bit of push from the government side. So that's quite interesting for me. Okay, uh, Rene, there was a question for you in the chat uh, in the Q and A. Any thoughts on recent DTP? 
DDPTC methods based for identity management? Unfortunately, I'm I'm not that expert on the topic. I have supported it. It could be a question that could be raised to the to the colleagues of um of the employees project. Uh, so if you want to contact me, just feel free to do so, and I can forward this. Okay. Good. Um. I, and also the other question we will will answer by by email. Um. Uh, because I have not really a right answer to uh, to I Katerina. Uh, now, um, since I see potential to uh, kind of continue and maybe replicate what what uh, has been presented today, and also there were some feedback from uh, the participants, um, uh, we will certainly set up uh, another webinar. Maybe uh, I'm not sure whether before or after the summer break, but but definitely more, more is going to come. And if you have uh, any other completely different topics, we should address. Uh, we welcome both ideas, but also uh, proposals for, for contributions to our webinar series. In this context, um, with running five minutes over, thanks first to our three distinguished speakers for, for your very interesting uh, presentations. Um, all the, the, especially Anthony, your paper is also published, uh, public available. Um, therefore, I think I came across you. And uh, and Duncan probably some some papers will be soon out by by you on this topic. Uh, we are maybe going to share also with the community here. Maybe having another webinar. We thanks also to the to the participants uh, for for your questions. Um, the the two open ones we we uh, we try to to answer bilateral. Thanks for uh, the the background work by Matilda and his team from from Trust IT. Uh, and in this context, I, I wish you a nice lunch, a nice, nice weekend, and hope to see you soon here on the CPLOG sites. And again, there's funding opportunity, uh, which you might really take advantage of uh, deadline May 20th. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. Maybe in Delft or some other locations. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 bye.